Jesus calls all of us to go and make disciples of all nations. The people of Sugar Creek are passionate about helping people in need and introducing them to the love of Jesus, to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. At Sugar Creek, we're committed to making Christ known here in our community and all across the world because he's given us a mission and a purpose to love and lead all people to life change in Christ. We're not a little church. We are a mighty army. Well, good morning. So great to be here with all of you here at the Sugarland campus. My name is Tim Homa. I have the privilege of being the Richmond Rosenberg campus pastor, and it is great being with all of you here today. And welcome to all of you watching online. Uh, those of you at our Missouri City campus, welcome in. And of course, big shout out to my home at Richmond Rosenberg. So glad that you are watching today and all together singing. What a great worship time, wasn't that? Marcus did a pretty good job. I don't know, he's a pretty good job there, didn't he? Well, I'm moving a little slow today. I threw my back out last night, moving my daughter up to the third floor of an apartment building, moving a heavy table. So right now, all the camera guys are worshiping the Lord, going, hallelujah, he's not gonna move. I'm gonna do my best. That's why the chair is here, but uh, I'm excited to be here today to continue on in our series of Love and Lead All People. You know, I grew up in a church-going family. As long as there was a Sunday, we were in church. We were in the pews. I attended eight years of parochial school, and so I had um, firsthand knowledge of who God was since I was a little kid. I knew God in my head, but I didn't have a relational perspective. Well, not yet. When I was in high school, a former classmate from our parochial school days we went to the same public school. She got up out of her desk one day, walked across the classroom, and invited me to her church. You see, our church that we attended to didn't have a youth group, but hers did. And she found a youth group that she wanted to share with me. I was a little leery, I was a little nervous, I was a little afraid to go to a church I had never been to. But I knew this girl. She had been my friend for eight years, and I trusted her, and I believed that I could go and check this church out and it wouldn't be as bad as I thought it would be. Well, I went to the youth group that night and literally there were hundreds of teenagers scattered all throughout this church, laughing, having a good time. I was a teenage boy, there was a lot of girls. It didn't hurt at all. There was competition games and that was a lot of fun competition and there was incredible music. And then a guy got up on the platform and he, he shared about life as a teenager, and what teenagers struggle with. And they shared about God's love for teenagers, and he shared about Jesus' love for teenagers. And it was in that day, in 1982, that it began my spiritual journey, that I learned what it meant to have a personal relationship with Jesus, not just head knowledge, but a movement in my heart. And then over the years, people began to teach me about this God who had this unconditional, outrageous kind of expansive love for all people, not certain people, not rich people, not highly educated people, but he had this crazy love for all people. And it began a journey in my life to learn more about him. And in these days, today in my life, I live by two words that I've learned over the course of the last 30 plus years. I've learned about grace and I've learned about power. You see, many of you are under the assumption that pastors tend to have found the formula or the solution to how to avoid the stumbles of life. That we don't have to worry about the big mistakes or the stumbles because we're up here, we're pastors. We must be in God's word on a regular basis. We must have got it all figured out. I, pay, I make a lot more mistakes than you think I make. And I need God's grace every single day. And I need God's power because every day I'm faced with challenges just like you're faced with challenges. Just like your neighbors are faced with challenges, just like your coworkers are faced with challenges. We're all faced with challenges and we've come to a point in our lives as Christians where we know God's grace and how important it is, but we also understand his power and how it gets us through every single day. 
There are people that you will encounter today after church that are far from God. These are people that you will encounter that have no idea about God's love for them. You're gonna have the opportunity to be in locations where you can look around and you're gonna be able to see people and know this about those people, that they are far from God, that they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You will have the opportunity to look, to see, to feel, to listen, and maybe hear the Holy Spirit prompting you to reach out to someone in that circle that you see or in that, at that coffee bar table or at that restaurant or in that workspace or in that classroom where God may be saying, I want to use you in that person's life. Today, I want to talk to you about the importance of being a church that cares, not just cares about Christians, but cares about all people. I want to share what it's like, and I want to share how we can step out of our circle of comfort. You know that circle of comfort where we're around the people that accept us and love us and they don't make us uncomfortable? And how do we move out of those circles? And how do we move into what I would call the zone of the unknown, where we move ourselves across the cul-de-sac, where we walk across the street, where we walk across the office area with fear and trembling, unknowing how they're going to receive us, and we greet them with a hug or a handshake. We, maybe we introduce ourselves, or maybe for the first time, we talk to them about our faith in Jesus for the very first time. And then we're going to see when we step out of that comfort zone what the Holy Spirit may be up to as he moves us into those relationships to see where God is working in that person's life. But maybe some of you this morning are saying, you know, why should I care? Let the church do that. That's what the church is about. I'm here for me. Why should I care? Why should I care about all people? I care about my family. I care about some people, but why all people? Why should I go through the trouble of beginning a conversation with somebody, maybe that I don't know, maybe that I don't trust, or maybe they'll reject me? Why do I have to walk across the room to talk to someone? You know, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants all of us to reach out to all people, but many of us make excuses. We make excuses because we fear being rejected, we fear of being labeled, we fear that they will never talk to us again. Some of us, we've become apathetic, where we have just said, you know what, I've done that, I've shared the gospel enough in my life, I've been an example enough, I'm just gonna live for me. I'm just gonna surround myself with the people that I need in my life. Over the last 10 years, I've had the awesome privilege of serving as a police chaplain for several different law enforcement agencies in Fort Bend. And being a police chaplain, you would assume when I say the word chaplain that I have unprecedented opportunities to talk to officers, deputies, all of law enforcement about God. That would be a wrong assumption. As a chaplain, I'm accredited with an organization that is faith-based. And one of the primary things that we are not allowed to do as chaplains in law enforcement is to evangelize, to share our faith, and talk about God until they bring it up. Several years ago, I was asked by a patrol captain to do a ride along with an officer who was dealing with some major depression. He was going through some suicidal ideology and thinking about taking his own life. His life was a mess, and the, op the captain wanted me to spend some time with this officer. And of course, getting into the car, it's always awkward when you do a ride along because officers know that when the chaplain's in the car with them, it's because their superior, superior sees something in that officer that needs some assistance. So the conversation starts off pretty slow. And then eventually I build some common interest questions. I talk about their life. I talk about what they're involved in. And eventually the walls come down and conversations open up. But this one ride along, I knew right away I was there by divine appointment. He shared about the hurt in his life. He shared about the pain in his life. He shared that he has done so many wrong things in life that he didn't deserve to live, that he didn't deserve anything that would be good coming his way. He shared that he was divorced and he had a kid and they never got to see his kid. His kid lived four hours away. He talked about all the pain that he was going through and all the wrong things he had done in his life. And I felt so much empathy for him. And so I just prayed that God would use me in some way in this man's life. 
This was only one of three ride-alongs. The last ride-along, we were stopped at a stoplight. And all of a sudden, I noticed he was crying uncontrollably. As we're waiting for a green light, tears are just like Niagara Falls coming down his eyes. And then he looked over at me and he said, do you think Jesus would accept me? Invitation. Open door. And at that moment, at a stoplight, that man prayed to receive Christ. He asked the Lord to come into his life. And his life was forever changed at that moment. I had the opportunity to witness this and be a part of this. Now, his life didn't become perfect after that. We all know that the Christian life is a journey. He actually got drunk later on, fell down the stairs and broke his neck. And I called him at his home as he was recovering. He said, you know what, chaplain? That was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. God got my attention that day, and I I intend on listening from now on. Let me ask you, what is, in your opinion, the highest value of personal evangelism? In your opinion, what's the highest value of personal evangelism? Well, before we get to that question, let me, see, let me share with you what Jesus says in Mark, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said this, that you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. How are we to be salt? How are we to be light? How are we to be able to step out of our comfort zones, walk across a room, a field, a golf green, a locker room, an office area? How are we to be in tune with where the Holy Spirit is prompting us to go? and to be salt in that person's world or light in that world. Because that's what God calls us to be in all situations to all people. Because we're to be a church that cares about all people, even those who don't know Jesus. So let me ask you, what is the highest value in your opinion of personal evangelism? Is it how many tally marks for saved people in a year? Is that a form of, is that your opinion of a value of personal evangelism is checking off how many salvations? Or maybe it's your opinion that it's how many gospel presentations that we've done. Oh, we've done, you know, we, we got another one, we got another one. Maybe for some of you it's coming up with a program or a formula that works for you that you can systematically share with somebody on a regular basis. Now, none of that is wrong. None of that is wrong, but in my opinion, in my value system. I think the greatest and highest value of personal evangelism is being fully attuned and cooperative with the movement and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. To be fully attuned and cooperative when God is moving us, when the Holy Spirit is moving us to talk to somebody, to make us walk across a a, a cul-de-sac to our neighbor's house, to care for them, to love them, Now, I would love it if every interaction I had with people who are far from God, who don't attend church, ends with me sharing with them the gospel and them praying to receive Christ. I hope that's my hope and prayer every single time I meet someone. But to be honest with you, that's not how the Holy Spirit works in my life. I'm not often the closer of the deal. I tend to be the opener. I tend to be the seed planter. You know, I'm the one that moves the team down the football field, then they bring in John Elway to finish the deal. You know what I'm saying? I, I can bring someone from the point where they don't believe in God to skepticism, and, but there's someone that's gonna come along the way that God is using to move from skepticism to life change in Christ. And that's okay, but I wanna be aware of those moments. I want to know that the Holy Spirit is moving in my life and prompting me to begin to plant seeds, to put the ball on the tee for the next person. I wanna be ready for that. Not all of us in here are going to be closers. Now, I've had the opportunity to see life change. Just two weeks ago, I was with a group of people from our church in Columbia, and I watched our team share the gospel in, in, in crazy ways and in crazy situations, and people responded to the gospel. I got a chance to sit with a man in his 70s who was broken, who knew he was without Jesus, living in darkness, lost, I saw him surrender his life to Jesus. And I want to be open, and I want to be attuned, and I want all of us to be attuned to the Holy Spirit because that's what it means to be a church that cares, that God is going to move us and motivate us to talk to people, to talk to all people, to, to involve ourselves in their life on a regular basis. 
I have told you from time to time from this platform and at, at Richmond Rosenberg that I train a dog to compete nationally in, in competitions. And I've told you that I love doing that because Max loves to do that, but that's not the only reason that I, can, I do that. Because I am consciously aware of the need to put myself in situations where there are non-church people, people who are far from God. And one of the reasons I train my dog at this specific area with these people is because there are people there that are far from God. And I want to rub shoulders with those people. I want to be around non-church people. I want to involve myself in those things. I've often been, been involved in extracurricular activities like softball and volleyball and football and all of those sports because I'm often around people who don't know Jesus. And I think that's what God has done in my life, that he's prompted me to be in those areas where I can be with lost people. So I had this opportunity to train my dog. And over the years of training, for five years, I've gotten to know the people in the class. And those people have gotten to know me. They know I'm a pastor. They know who I live for every single day. They know that I pray for them because I tell them. Several of them have been to our campus because I've invited them. And one time, I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit that says, you need to go invite that person on the other side of the field. And it was somebody I had built a relationship with. And so I walked over and I just said, hey, we're having a service at our campus this weekend. I just want to invite you if you wanted to come see our campus. And I, when we got to Sunday, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think she would show up. After service, she walked down and I was totally surprised. I'm like, you came here... You, I'm totally surprised. She said, well, you, you invited me. <laughs> I did. I invited her. And I invited several others who came to my campus. And I've had the chance to baptize some of them at our campus. How many of you, on a regular basis, rub shoulders with people who are far from God? Intentionally. How many of you intentionally involve yourself with activities where non-believers are prevalent? What good does it do us, no matter where you're at on the age scale, for us to surround ourselves with only Christians all the time? God has called this church to care for all people, and that includes lost people. When we're modeling, when we're living it out, when we're showing people where we're loving and leading all people to life change, I think the highest form of personal evangelism it's not about formulas, not about tally marks, but it's about listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and watching what God does through those occurrences we have with those people. And I think God has called all of us to be that type of church, to care for all people. And in, through my encounters, whether it be on the volleyball court or in dog training class or in a police car, I've made some observations about the importance of being attuned with the Holy Spirit, and I want to share those with you today. And the first observation... First observation I made is that we need to be in places where the lost live. Jesus said that we're the salt of the earth. Salt can only be affected when it's close to something, near something, by something. And I call this the proximity principle. I find that a lot of Christians have savor and they have vitality and they're excited about their faith. You've met these people. Maybe you're one of them. You love the Lord. You talk about the Lord and how the Lord's working in your life and you're always sharing and you're, you have that that vigorous about you, that you just love God, but yet you're not around people who need to know about Jesus. You're excited about him, but you don't surround yourself. You're not in close proximity to them. And this is a dangerous phenomenon that is occurring in Christians today, and I don't get it, but there's now this recent, recent reluctance to be around people who are far from God. When's the last time you had breakfast or lunch or dinner with someone who doesn't know Jesus? When's the last time you went jogging or played golf or played tennis or pickleball with somebody recreationally that was far from God? Aren't we reminded in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation? We live in a world that is in trouble. No one has to tell us that this world is filled with hate, sin, and despair. We see it every single day. And no one has to remind us that we're in a messy world right now. And the Bible says that there are people who are lost. And when the Bible says that, it doesn't mean they're looking for directions. It doesn't mean they're lost because they need direction to get someplace. The Bible calls it living in darkness. Look what Paul says in Ephesians chapter four. 
Beginning in verse 17, Paul says, Live no longer as the unsaved do, lost. For they are helplessly confused, lost. Their closed minds are full of darkness. They are far away from the life of God because they have shut their minds and hardened their hearts against him, lost. Paul is talking about all of mankind here, but we know that he's also talking about individual people that you know and that I know, friends, family members, co-workers. Think about the people you go to school with. Think about those family members that are part of the little league that you're a part of, or maybe you're part of the PTO, those members on the PTO board that are far from God. People you know that you're around on a regular basis that are lost without Christ. And we need to be in close proximity to them. We need to be around them. They need to see us and we need to see them. The the second observation I wanna make has to do with how we're wired up. God has wired you up for a specific purpose. And I call this the congruency principle. You see, me being in a cop car or me being on a dog training field or me being on a volleyball court is congruent for how God has wired me up. I'm relational. I wanna be in those circles. I wanna be where there's a lot of people, a lot of energy. I wanna be around people that I, I can have affinity with and a connection with, that, that I can, it's just comfortable for me to be. Some of you are great at one-on-one. Some of you are great in groups. Some of you need to be in coffee shops. Some of you can have an invitation in your home. But God has wired you up for a specific purpose. And he wants to use you, he wants to use me, he wants to use our church in exactly the way that he's wired us up so that we can be around those people. And God can use us to break down those walls. He wants us to be able to walk across those locker rooms, walk across our, our, our cul-de-sacs, our parking lots, and engage in conversations by how he's wired us up. And you know how you're wired up because you're, no, you're, you're different, completely different than the per- person next to you. God doesn't make clones. Every one of you is wired up here uniquely as the way God intended. Your IQ is your IQ. Your personality is your personality. Your temperament and your experiences are your experiences. And there's a reason why you went through the brokenness and the hurt and the pain in your life. There's a reason why you went through that. Because then you'll have that kind of sensitivity when someone you meet as you cross across the room, be able to meet them right where they're at because you went through the similar situation. And I think, I think we do people a great service when we understand this principle, when we understand how we're wired up. Because when we're wired up in a certain way, we break down the walls that can be created in our lives. We're all different. I saw this quote and I put it in your study notes. I just thought, man, it was such a kind of a in my face, you know, head blown moment. It said this, don't be afraid of being different. Be afraid of being the same as everyone else. Be different and celebrate it because that's how God wired you to be. Look what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse six and eight. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophecy, speak out with him as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is encouraging others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you the leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. This says a lot about how we're wired by God. Because you can see yourself somewhere in this. I'm wired to do that. I'm going to use that to reach people who don't know Jesus. And then look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. We're to stay attuned to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We're to be in close proximity to people. To be close to them. To be salt in this earth. On this earth. We're to have 
the understanding of how we're wired up to be used by God. And th- my third observation is that we need to find common ground with people, similar interests. When that officer and I were in the car together, we were asking questions about each other's lives, our favorite sports teams, about our kids. Yeah, it wasn't to the depth of his hurt and pain yet, but we were getting to know each other. We have an opportunity to talk about life, and that was a bridge builder. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be wise as servants, gentle as doves. It, there's great wisdom when we show common interest, when we have common interests with other people, because it breaks down these walls and allows us to have conversation that's open. Jesus comes to the well. He walks across the field to the well, and, and there's a woman there with a checkered past. The first thing that Jesus talks to the woman about is not about her marital infidelity or her five broken relationships. What does, she talk to, what does he talk to her about? Jesus talks to her about water. The conversation is a common interest. They're at a well, they're talking about water. And eventually it leads to living water. But Jesus is building a bridge. He, that's how it started. It started with water. So whatever passion, whatever interest you, you have in your life that can connect you with someone who is a non-church goer or someone who is far from God, you know what it's going to do? It's going to allow them to see that we're pretty normal as Christians, that we have interests just like everybody else, and that we can be approached and we can develop a relationship with them and we can you know, build bridges with them. We need to be able to build, a, extend a bridge through common interests so that eventually we can share with them how wonderful God has been in our lives, how we trust him and how we love him and our life has changed and different because of him being in our life. And they'll begin to see that simply out of building through common interests. The fourth observation I've made, it's not about you. I had a moment in that cop car in one of my ride-alongs where I could have thrown the God car down right then and there. I could have said, officer, I know your life is in shambles. You're going through the worst situation in your life, but I got Jesus in my life, and I'm happy, and I know where I'm headed after I die. I could have done that, and I would have lost integrity. I would have lost any opportunity to further that conversation with him. I would have been unethical because of the organization I worked for at that time. I I would have forfeited the opportunity to make a difference in that man's life being used by God at that moment if I had laid down that God card right then and there. We have to remember that evangelism is not about you. It's not about me. Jesus' talk at the well starts with water, and eventually it talks, it, it, it proceeds to a conversation about religious confusion that the woman had. And God's, and Jesus said, you know what? I want to talk about you. I want to talk about this confusion. And eventually it talks to, uh, leads to talking about living water. But it started with being about the woman. See, it's not about us. It's more about what we make of the other person's life and where they're at. It's just better that way. Yet there are two kinds of people that think it's about them. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you know somebody like this. There are the interrupters, and then there are the avoiders. Interrupters are people that they have responded to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. They go and they walk across the locker room. They walk across the office. They engage in conversation, but they're just biding their time. They're just chomping at the bit. They're just waiting for the moment. They're like ready to go. They're ready to share about the gospel. And they're listening to this person, but they're not listening. And then all of a sudden they just blur out, you know, it's been two and a half minutes now. So let me tell you about God. And that person's like, well, we were just talking about golf. Wait a minute, how did God get into this conversation? Wait, time out, wait a minute. Can I coach up you interrupters? I know we're excited, I know what's at stake, trust me. I live with that every single day of my life as well. I know what's at stake. Eternity hangs in the balance, I get that. But interrupters, chill, really, chill. If God prompted you to go across your cul-de-sac, cross your classroom to engage in a conversation, he's going to orchestrate all the rest. You don't have to barge in. Only go as far as God wants you to go. Don't go beyond where God is. God's going to open the door. It's going to be his timing. It's going to be a perfect plan because God is the one doing the work here. 
It's the Holy Spirit working within that person. And God is using you to, to build that bridge. You don't have to interrupt. It doesn't have to be about you. Relax. God's got this. Remember, you're talking to an image bearer of God. Created by God. The same God that we love and worship has created that person. Made that person in his image. And we need to listen. We need to be available. We need to be present with them. When I was in that cop car, I was simply present for that officer. Just being there, allowing God to do his thing. And here's something we can all learn in how we care for others as a church. Only go as far as God wants you to go. God's got the timing all perfected. He'll move. When you need to stop, stop. When you need to go further, keep going. But trust God in this. This is more than scorekeeping of how many presentations you're given, how many gospel presentations you have up on the tally board. There's more at stake here. But on the other hand, there are avoiders. These are the people who have heard the prompting of the, of the Holy Spirit, have walked across to that person. God has opened the doors wide open for them, and they freeze. They freeze out of fear of rejection. They, fear, they freeze because they're afraid they don't know enough about the Bible. They, they're afraid of being labeled or put into some God group that they don't want to be a part of. And they just stop at the moment where God wants to use them. If you're an avoider and you're, you doubt that, remember God is in this thing. God has got a plan. He's got a purpose for you that in that moment. He wants to use you. Don't be, remember what hangs in the balance here. Eternity. Eternity hangs in the balance. And you may be the only person that this person's going to learn about God from. Remember what it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 6. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And if we're attuned with the Holy Spirit and we have that opportunity, we've got to say it. We've got to walk through it and not apologize for it. We've got to get away from these extremes, the interrupting and the avoiding. We've got to be people who cultivate a vital walk with God every single day so that we will be ready day or night when the Holy Spirit prompts us to walk across our office areas, to visit people in our neighborhoods, when we have opportunities with our families, to make an introduction about who God is in our life, to greet somebody with a hug or a shaker, meet them for the very first time and tell them about this incredible God that you love and that you worship. And we can't get around this. People we know and love, members of our family, our friends, our co-workers who don't know Christ will not be in heaven because they are without Jesus. For many of them, you may be the only Bible they ever see in their life. So what happens when we follow that prompting? What happens when we follow through with what God wants us to do and we go as far as God wants us to go and we do as much as God wants us to do? We begin to see the results of life change. We begin to see the power of the Holy Spirit in that person, in our coworker, in our family member. We allow God to use us because we care about our neighbor, because we care about our coworker, we care about our family, because we're a church that cares about all people. Look what it says in John chapter 5, verse 24. It says, Truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in me, who sent me as everlasting life and shall not come to judgment, but has path, passed from death into life. Prompted by the Holy Spirit, conversation happens with you and that person, and they move from death to life. And Jesus tells what that life is. In John chapter 17, verse three, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. By simply being in tune with the Holy Spirit, following his prompts and movement in your life, you walk across to someone who doesn't know God and God moves in their life and they come to know Jesus and they surrender their lives to him because you know that eternity hangs in the balance and their life begins to be transformed just like your life was transformed. You know it wasn't perfect, right? It was like being a newborn when you first became a believer. You had to learn how to live life. You had to learn what it meant to be a follower. There was gonna be some stumbles, some setbacks, but all along, life transformation was occurring in that person 
you follow through with with God to share with them about the love of Jesus. You see their life change, even though it's up and down, but God giving them strength to get through each and every day. Imagine your friend one day spending eternity in heaven. Imagine one day that friend walking up to you in heaven and saying, thank you for loving and leading me to Jesus. I'm here because you were willing to walk across the room to talk with me, to share with me about your relationship with Jesus. I'm here because of you. Why do we care? Why does the church care? Because eternity hangs in the balance. We may be the only ones who ever invites that person to know Jesus. And it's because of your closeness to them. It's because of what you have in common with them. It's because of who, how you're wired up by God. And it's because of the relationship you built with them that leads them, your friend, your family member, your coworker, to life change in Christ that moves them from death to life. We need to be a church that continues to care, to care for all people. And I pray that that's the church we're a part of. That we break out of our circles, we go into the zone of unknown, and we listen to the Holy Spirit as he leads us to be people who love and lead all people. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you that somebody was prompted by your Holy Spirit to come into my life to share with me about your son's love for me and how I could have a personal relationship with him. God, I pray that today that there may be someone in this room that the Holy Spirit is knocking on their heart for the very first time. I pray that they would surrender their heart to you today, that they would invite your son into their life, that their life would be forever changed, moving from death to life. God, Thank you for allowing us to be a church that cares. May we be a church that cares for all people. All people, Lord. God, we thank you for Jesus. We pray all of this in his name. Amen.